Hello and welcome back. I'm Steve Murphy, a trust and estates attorney with McGuire Woods LLP. And this is Legacy Planning Once Removed, my podcast on estate planning, trusts, property, legacy, and everything else on my mind. As you've seen from our past episodes, we had a recent discussion on charitable planning with my colleague, Hunter Glenn. That episode focused primarily on outright gifts and gift agreements. And she and I realized that the topic could become a series of episodes on this issue of charitable planning. There's just so much to cover in this space. And there's a variety of really interesting strategies available to clients who want to incorporate charitable giving into their planning. In fact, it seems best to think of this like a spectrum. Last episode, we covered those outright gifts. And we saw that one downside to outright gifts is that the client has to decide now or has to decide effective on the client's death, which charity or charities to benefit. Many clients would like to retain more flexibility over which charities to benefit and how and when. So in this next episode, we'll cover donor advised funds, a great way to build in that kind of flexibility. And to start working through those other topics, I thought I'd bring Hunter back onto the podcast. So welcome back, Hunter. Hi, Steve. Thanks. I'm excited to be back. Well, great. It's great to have you. When you were last on the podcast, we talked about those outright gifts and how clients can incorporate certain wishes for those gifts into a gift agreement. But that's just one approach a client might take. I know there are plenty of other strategies a client can use especially if they want to make several charitable gifts or if they want to make charitable giving a larger part of their planning. So I thought we could talk this week about those donor advised funds. Yeah, that's certainly a very popular strategy in the charitable giving space right now, and their use has only been increasing in recent years. In fact, I was just presenting with another one of our colleagues, Michelle McKinnon, at our firm's nonprofit seminar the other week and donor advised funds came up in a couple of the sessions. As part of the presentation, we offered a few figures to put that popularity in context, and I think they're pretty telling. For example, according to one report by National Philanthropic Trust, as of 2022, over $228 billion in assets were held by donor advised funds, and donor advised funds received 22% of all U.S. individual contributions. Assets held by DAFs have grown by 513% over the last 20 years, ballooning from just $38 billion in 2011 to $234 billion in 2021. I recognize these numbers are a few years old, but I would imagine they're only going to continue to increase when they're updated for 2024. Wow. I mean, I think about those numbers, and those numbers make sense, but those numbers are striking. Um, and I'd encourage anyone who's interested in this development of this area, go back and look at the show notes and you can see those actual numbers and percentages and years. That's just really striking. I mean, clearly people are attracted to this particular strategy of the donor advised fund and they appreciate the flexibility that those funds offer. I know there are some interesting characteristics of donor advised funds, which we can get into, but how about this? Let's start with the basics. How do they work, and what role does the donor play in a donor-advised fund? Sure. So this isn't a separate charitable entity. Instead, this is a separately identified giving account established with a sponsoring organization that qualifies as a public charity. And these sponsoring organizations can be public charities like a local community foundation, but you also have some more national financial institutions creating their own charitable arm for these purposes as well. And then once the donor establishes the fund with that sponsoring organization, the donor can make contributions as frequently as they might like, and the donor receives an income tax charitable deduction for those gifts. Then once the fund is funded, the donor makes recommendations to the sponsoring organization to make certain grants to other charitable organizations from that donor specific fund. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the income tax charitable deduction for donor advised funds. I think getting into the details of that is beyond the scope of this episode, but it's important to caution those donors that those rules on 
the income tax charitable deduction and how much they can claim, those are complicated and they should talk to their advisors as they plan these kinds of gifts. But all that being said, I found that these donor advised funds or DAFs are really easy to establish. So it's not much more complicated than making an outright gift. And it's easier than a private foundation, which we'll, we'll have to get into in a later episode. Is that what you found as well? Yeah, that's right. Whereas other tax exempt entities often require a filing an application with the IRS and other reporting, these can be established pretty quickly with the sponsoring organization. That makes them really helpful for clients who want to make a large charitable gift and obtain the income tax deduction now, but aren't exactly sure what charitable organization they ultimately want to benefit. Because they're so easy to establish, the donor can fund, make the gift, claim the deduction, and then in the coming months or even years, recommend grants from their fund to other charitable organizations. Yeah, that flexibility is really terrific. In addition to that flexibility and how easy it is to establish the donor advised fund, what are some other benefits of these DAFs that you see? Well, I mean, along the lines of ease of establishment is also ease of administration. Because the fund is with a public charity, it's not subject to the same rules that a private foundation might be, like, for example, a minimum distribution requirement. Private foundations are required to distribute 5% of their non-charitable use assets each year. Donor advised funds, on the other hand, don't have that same minimum distribution requirement. And then there are other rules that apply to private foundations that also wouldn't apply to a donor advised fund. There are also some tax differences as well. For example, there are some taxes that would apply to assets held by a private foundation, like the excise tax on net investment income, and those don't apply to funds held by a donor advised fund. And then, because the gift is ultimately being made to a public charity, and Steve, you kind of touched on this a minute ago, it's complicated, but the gift a donor makes to their fund generally receives more favorable tax treatment for income tax deduction purposes. On top of that, there isn't an annual tax return required for these funds, which is also helpful in terms of accounting and administrative type costs, which leads to another benefit, actually. If a donor is really concerned about privacy, a donor advised fund might be appealing. Private foundations must report the contributions made to the organization, but also the distributions from the organization on its annual tax return. And that annual return, called a Form 990-PF, is publicly available. Because a donor advised fund does not have the same reporting requirement, the donor can make grants from the fund anonymously. And some clients really prefer that. And then finally, I think it's helpful to note the benefit the donor receives from having the fund administered by that sponsoring organization. To the extent there is reporting required, the sponsoring organization is handling that along with the logistics and steps related to actually making distributions. And because the sponsoring organization is involved, you've got a bit of an infrastructure with guardrails to avoid running into compliance issues, like is the grant permissible and certain other decision points. Oh well, yeah, those are all great advantages of this donor advised fund structure. So we've talked a lot about those pros of the DAFs, but how about some of the characteristics that you've seen they cause clients to choose a different structure? That is, are there any disadvantages or downsides that you see? Yeah, there are a few that come to mind. First, while there is some succession planning available, there's not the same opportunity for that as there is with another structure, like a private foundation. For example, while a sponsoring organization might allow you to name a successor advisor, you don't have the same flexibility to build out an appointment structure or board of directors that you would have with a private foundation's trust agreement or articles and bylaws. And in some cases, if all of the advisors to the fund die without naming a successor, the funds may pass back to the sponsoring organization. Because some clients are using these structures for their legacy, they may want to have a more detailed plan to set out what they want for the governing board and functions of the, of the organization. There can also be some limited investment options for the fund. I think, though, what gives the client the most pause is the donor advised aspect of these funds. 
In order for this structure to qualify for tax-exempt status, the sponsoring organization must truly own and control the donated funds. The donor retains advisory privileges, but ultimately they're only making recommendations to the sponsoring organization. And that can be a little discomforting for some clients, particularly when they think through how much control they may or may not have over the funds if they're no longer satisfied with the sponsoring organization managing the funds and their relationship there. Yeah, that reminds me of the Pinkert case from the Ninth Circuit a few years ago. That case really illustrates that point. That's the type of case that we report on in our seminars. Uh, right now, October 2024, I just got back from a great trip to Iowa and South Dakota and Nebraska, giving a talk to some bankers there about some of these types of cases and recent developments in this area. But in any way, the Pinkert case, in that case, the donor brought an action against the sponsoring organization alleging a breach of fiduciary duty. The donor took issue with the sponsoring organization's use of their investment arm and the related administrative and investment fees with respect to this DAF. But ultimately, the court agreed with the sponsoring organization's argument that the donor just lacked standing to make these kinds of claims, to make these kinds of complaints. The court found that because the sponsoring organization retains exclusive ownership over the funds, the donor no longer had any property rights in his donor advised fund. He only retained advisory privileges. Yes, I just made air quotes right there. Advisory, as in just giving advice and not really in ultimate control, you know, similar to your point recently, uh, Hunter. And in providing this opinion, the court focused on both federal law, but also on the sponsoring organization's program policies which the donor had accepted and which made clear that the donor was only permitted to provide non-binding advice on the administration of the fund. And I think this case is really helpful just to mention to clients if they're worried about that control aspect, because it just illustrates how a donor advice fund would work, especially in situations where the relationship goes south. Exactly, the client has to be okay with truly relinquishing that control. All that said, though, I do think it's important to remember the practical side of these matters. In practice, I think the sponsoring organizations would quickly lose their donors if they were creating a reputation for not actually taking the donor's recommendations to heart. But like you said, this is certainly a cautionary tale for clients as they think through what structure they might want to utilize. And if the client's uncomfortable with that, I'll use your air quotes, advised structure, that's okay. As we've noted, there are certainly plenty of other tools in our toolkit that the donor might prefer, like a private foundation. Yeah, that's right. And that sounds like a good segue into what we might talk about next time. Given some of our discussions today, I think talking through private foundations might be helpful, maybe at that next step on the spectrum. Yeah, I agree. I find that often clients are considering one of the two, and it really comes down to talking through the characteristics of each with the client when they're mapping out their charitable plan. Yeah, what comes to mind for me for a donor advised fund is something that we talk about a lot on this podcast. We like simplicity and ease of administration, but we want to caution when something is simple to a fault. I've used that term before, simple to a fault. Maybe that's the best summary as fun. It's very simple and straightforward, but the client might lose something in choosing that simple and efficient structure. Well, once again, this has been a great discussion and, and hopefully a helpful session for our listeners who are considering this kind of charitable giving. Before we wrap up, you know, Hunter, I like to try to leave the listeners with a takeaway or a thought exercise. Do you have any final thoughts you want to share on the subject? Yeah, we've talked a lot about the pros and the cons and the basics of donor advised funds, but I think it's important to kind of step back and also note that this is definitely an area where we're probably going to see some movement in the coming years. And what I mean by that, for example, and we actually talked a lot about this during our seminar the other week, the Treasury issued proposed regulations to address certain definitions in the code relating to donor advised funds. The regulations were pretty controversial because of how broad they were, and the Treasury received a lot of feedback during the notice and comment period. We'll see what ultimately winds up happening with those and if they're in fact enacted, 
But I just mentioned that to say that this is still a very much developing area. It's a great time to incorporate this type of planning, but there can also be aspects you'll want to talk through with your council too. But in terms of a thought exercise, maybe it's best to ask the client how they feel about this kind of simple structure. With a donor advised fund, they gain something. Like you said, simplicity and flexibility. But they don't get a lot of flexibility for governance or investment options and who really has the ultimate say about distributions. The listeners might get, give some thought as to whether that matters to them. If that kind of flexibility is important, they may want to look at a different kind of structure. Well, this has been great. Thanks so much, Hunter. And I'll stay tuned to hear your thoughts on some of those other charitable structures to consider as an alternative to a donor advised fund or if a donor advised fund isn't a good fit. And to all our listeners, thanks again. I'm Steve Murphy here with Hunter Glenn, and this has been Legacy Planning Once Removed, my podcast on thoughtful estate planning. Thanks for listening.